Hello, it's now 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and you've joined the 2021 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Solicitation Webinar. To allow for additional sign-ins past the hour, we'll be starting the webinar in just a couple of minutes, so please hold on in the session. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining today's 2021 Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Solicitation Webinar. Today's training is going to be focused on the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program Solicitation. My name is Allison Upton. I'm a project manager at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I'm going to be moderating today's webinar, which is funded by the U.S. Department of Justice Bureau, Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA, as we like to say. To give you a preview of today's webinar, first I'll introduce our speakers, then there'll be an overview of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, or JMHCP as we call it for short. After that, we'll discuss the award information, budget, application criteria, followed by the submission requirements. And finally, towards the end of the webinar, we'll have time for questions and answers. And just a couple of uh, housekeeping items for everyone in attendance today. Anytime during the webinar, please feel free to, if you'd like to ask a question, just type it into the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand portion of your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. We'll try to reply to technical questions in the chat window as we go. And for the content-related questions, we'll keep a running list and address them at the end of the webinar. We'll, we'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter any technical or audio problems during this webinar, please call WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239. Please understand that there are some technical issues that we may not be able to resolve, uh, but we are recording this webinar and we will post it on our uh, website by the end of next week at latest. Our speakers today include, first of all, uh, our Eric Dietrich, who is a division chief in the BJA program's office. He supervises a team of state policy advisors who administer the BJA Adult Drug Court Veterans Treatment Court and the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, JMHCP. Eric and his team also oversee the Upholding the Rule of Law and Preventing Wrongful Conviction Discretionary Grant Programs, as well as the Justice Assistance Grant and the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Formula Programs in 10 states. Prior to his promotion in 2016, Eric served as a state policy advisor in BJA, managing a portfolio of justice information sharing and law enforcement focused training and technical assistance cooperative agreements. Before coming to BJA in 2013, Eric had over six years of experience developing federal grant proposals, to, including two successful JMHCP applications. Our next speaker is Tammy Lovell, who is 
one of uh, the state policy advisors uh, within Eric's team at the U.S. Department of Justice, the Bureau of Justice Assist Assistance. And in her role, Tammy works with many grantees within the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. Prior to joining BJA, Tammy worked as the law enforcement lead for Maryland's state administering agency, the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth and Victim Services. Demetrius Thomas is another one of our panelists today, and he is the Deputy Program Director in the Behavioral Health Division at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. So Demetrius oversees the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program tra Training and Technical Assistance uh, and all the grantee work. Prior to joining the Justice Center, Demetrius worked at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, where, where he led the agency's work at the intersection of criminal justice and mental health, mental and behavioral health, including establishing the city's first ever diversion centers, co-response, and mobile crisis teams. And as I said, I'm Allison Upton. I'm a project manager also in the Behavioral Health Division at the CSG Justice Center, and I provide and help oversee technical assistance to JMHCP grantees. I also support policy development and projects specializing at that intersection of criminal justice and behavioral health issues. Prior to joining the CSG Justice Center, I worked uh, at the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services, uh, which is a local not-for-profit here in New York City as their a director of court programs where I oversaw the court and community operations of several alternative to incarceration and detention programs serving adults with behavioral health needs in New York County. So I want to say a big thank you to all of our uh, speakers for for joining into the webinar today. Thank you so much. Okay, next I'm going to provide some brief overviews on the mission of the Bureau of Justice Assistance or BJA, um, the Council of State Governance Justice Center and the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program. So BJA's mission is to help make communities safer by strengthening the nation's criminal justice system. Its grants, training and technical assistance and policy development services provide state, local and indigenous nations with the cutting edge tools and best practices they need to reduce violent and drug related crime to support law enforcement and combat victimization. I'll give you some brief background on the Council of State Governments Justice Center as well. The CSG Justice Center is a national nonprofit nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership membership association representing state officials in all three branches of government with the expertise of a policy and research team focused on assisting others to attain measurable results. Our staff works to develop research driven strategies to increase public safety and strengthen communities. This next slide describes a bit more about our work style and how we strive to reflect Justice Center core values, which include a commitment to being independent and nonpartisan in every aspect of our work, providing rigorous, trusted, high quality analysis, developing practical and innovative solutions informed by data and research, promoting collaboration and building consensus, and being inclusive and respectful of diverse views and experiences. Today's webinar is a part of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, a training and technical assistance, which many of you may already be familiar with if you currently have or have in the past had a JMHCP grant. The JMHCP promotes innovative cross-system collaboration and provides grants directly to states, local government, and federally recognized indigenous nations to improve responses for people with mental illness and substance use disorders who are involved in the criminal justice system. And I'll be back uh, in a little bit to discuss the JMHCP application criteria and submission requirements. But in the meantime, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Demetrius, who will discuss uh, the JMHCP award information. Demetrius. Thanks, Allison. The eligible applicants for this grant are city or township government. The next slide. The eligible applicants for this grant are city or township governments, city governments, indigenous nations, federally recognized by the state of the interior, public and state control institutions of higher education, state governments, and mental, and mental health or criminal justice, justice agencies. A mental health agency is an agency of state or local governments or its con contracted agency that is responsible for mental health services or co-occurring mental health and substance addiction services. A substance abuse agency 
It's considered an eligible applicant if the agency provides services to people with co-occurring mental illness and substance addiction, or CMISA. A criminal justice agency is an agency of state or local government or its contracting agency that is responsible for detection, arrest, enforcement, prosecution, defense, adjudication, incarceration, probation, or parolee relating to a violation of the criminal laws of that state or local government. While a local government criminal justice agency can apply to this solicitation as lead, can, supply, can apply to this solicitation as lead, this solicitation is not intended for law enforcement response programs. There's a separate solicit solicitation title, Connect and Protect Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Responses that is designed to support law enforcement behavioral health fraud system collaborations and which is accepting applications through July 6th. We will be discussing this application a little later in this and at a future webinar. I want to highlight an important point because in the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program aims to promote cross systems collaboration. Only applications that are jointly administered by a criminal justice agency and a mental health agency will be considered. However, under this solicitation, only one applicant by any particular only one application by any particular applicant will be considered. All other agencies or agencies must be proposed as subrecipients or subgrantees. Also, the lead agency must be a city or township government, county government, indigenous nation, again federally recognized by the Secretary, Secretary of the Interior, public and state control institutions of state higher education, state government, or other mental health agency and criminal justice agency. Next slide. The focus of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program is to promote collaborative responses that improve outcomes for people with mental illness and co-occurring substance addiction who come into contact with the justice system. The cross system collaborations between criminal justice and mental health agencies can improve outcomes for the individual as well as promote public promote positive public safety and public health outcomes for the community. JMHCP supports a wide range of cross systems improvements. This includes, but is not limited to, mental health court and other court based responses, cross training for public safety, mental health professionals, and strategies that increase cross agency collaboration. Please note this solicitation supports programs targeted at people inside the criminal justice system and returning to the community. While law enforcement agencies can apply as leads under this solicitation, this solicitation does not support law enforcement responses programs. For those wishing to respond with programs that support law, enfor law enforcement response programs um, or people not already inside the criminal justice or returning to the community, please respond to the Connect and Protect Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Response Program solicitation. Again, we will be discussing this solicitation briefly later in this webinar. This year, the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program solicitation is particularly focused on three objectives and seeking applications to address one or more of these objectives, which include, first, enhance, expand, and operate mental health drop-off crisis stabilization treatment centers. Please note, these centers can provide, but are not limited to the following services, screening and assessment, crisis care, residential treatment, assistant outpatient mental health treatment, primary, primary care service, telehealth, competency restoration, community transition, and reentry and support. The second objective is increase evidence-based community capacity for mental health advocacy and wraparound services, and or number three, provide pro programmatic support and capacity building for criminal justice professionals, such as jail, courts, community supervisors, to, and which are aimed to help reduce recidivism. For applicants who are awarded a Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program award, there are, there are a few deliverables that all awardees must complete. 
First, there is a two phase process consisting of first planning and then second implementation. For phase one, the planning phase, the grant recipients will receive intensive training and technical assistance or TTA from the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Under this, under this phase, grantees follow a document called the Planning and Implementation Guide or PNI Guide. This document is refined every year to meet the grantees' needs. As outlined in the solicitation, within eight months of receiving federal, a final approval of the project's budget from OJP, grantees can spend up to $100,000 during this planning phase to work with the Justice Center on the PNI guide. Past grantees have found that the planning phase helps to prioritize where to begin implementation. The second phase is the implementation phase, which grantees begin after BJA approves the grantees' PNI guide. The grantees could then spend the remaining grant funds on directly related implementation activities. In addition, awardees must also develop a coordinated and documented approach to implementing and enhancing services corresponding with the three deliverables just mentioned above. And be able to complete both the planning and implementation phases during the 36 months or three year dur duration of the grant as well as engage in regular TTA with us at the Justice Center during both the planning and implementation phases of the program and outline sustainability plans for the program after this BJA awarded funding ends. The Office of Justice, the Office of Justice Programs of which the Bureau of Justice Assistance is a part weighs many factors when making funding decisions. This includes, but is not limited to, giving priority consideration to applications that meet the following criteria. One, promote effective strategies by law enforcement identifying and reducing the risk of harm to individuals with mental illness or co-occurring mental illness and substance addiction and to public safety. Two, for identifying and treating females with mental illness and co-occurring mental illness and substance addiction. Three, expanding the use of mental health courts and related services. Four, providing proposed interventions that have shown have been shown by empirical evidence to, re to reduce recidivism, as well as other program priority areas, including using validated assessment tools to identify and prioritize individuals with a moderate or high risk of recidivism and a need for treatment services and or that demonstrates and ensure that one, funds are used for public health and public safety, two, active participants or co-applicants in admin administering the project, and three, the documents that funds for treatment of those incarcerated will provide transition and re-entry ser re services for such individuals. Again, I just want to emphasize that applications must include detailed activities for both the planning and implementation phases, include at least one criminal justice and one mental health agency that will work on the program together with roles and responsibilities being codified and included in attached MOU. Please note, while it is mandatory to include an MOU, the MOU does not have to be executed if obtaining signatures may prevent application submission. However, Without signatures, full access to funding could be limited. Finally, there is an anticipated total of 18 awards with each grant, with each awardee receiving $550,000 for a 36 months or three year project, which is expected to begin on October 1st, 2021. Thanks everyone. Right now, I'm going to hand it over to Tammy, who will discuss the different budget requirements. Tammy. Thank you, Demetrius. The budget should be complete, cost effective, and allowable. All costs should be reasonable, allocable, and necessary for project activities. Remember, only $100,000 of funds will be available to complete the planning phase, to complete the planning phase in the first 12 months of the project. The budget should clearly indicate the cost for the planning phase. Also note that there are several costs that are not allowed 
with the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program funding. The program does not fund construction. Additionally, prizes, rewards, entertainment, trinkets, or any other monetary incentives, client stipends, gift cards, vehicle purchases, and food and or beverages are all considered unallowable costs. Next slide. The Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program authorizing legislation also requires a non-federal match of 20% total project cost in project years one and two, and 40% of total project costs in project year three. Cash and or in kind, such as third party match, are allowed. <clears throat> Match costs in the budget must meet the same guidelines as the federal cost for being allowable, reasonable, allocable, and necessary for the project. It's recommended that you do not include excessive match over the minimum requirements in the application budget. Finally, for clarification between the difference between subawards versus procurement contracts, <clears throat> Please carefully review the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide, which is linked in the solicitation. Subsection titled Information on Proposed Subawards, if any are planned, and Proposed Procurement Contracts, again, if you plan on having any. And the resources linked therein to ensure you properly categorize your costs in these sections. <clears throat> there are different administrative requirements related to each. For example, a procurement contract requires a full and open competition. However, a subaward does not. I want to thank you all for joining the webinar, and now I'm going to turn it back over to Allison. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> okay. Um, so next, we are going to focus in a little bit more on what a JMHCP application should include. Uh, the information on this slide and the next slide is a list of items that must be included in all application submissions for a JMHCP grant to meet the basic requirements to advance to peer review and receive consideration for funding. We've also included where each document should be completed and submitted. This next slide continues to detail the materials needed for the JMHCP application and just a, a couple of quick notes. Um, please be aware that applicants uh, are actually not required to submit performance data with the application. Rather, performance measures information is included as an alert that successful applicants will be required to submit performance data as part of the reporting requirements under the JMHCP award. Also, an applicant, uh, any applicant that proposes to use award funds to conduct project evaluations must follow the guidance under the, the note on project evaluations under the OJP grant application resource guide. And please also be aware that on the last page of this year's JMHCP solicitation is an application checklist, which details all the attachments that are needed as we've done here to complete and submit an application. This is a really helpful organizational tool to use um, as you go through the application process. So we just encourage you to look for that on the last page of the solicitation. Applica excuse me, applications that meet the basic minimum requirements will be reviewed by peer reviewers and applications will be evaluated on how the proposed project or program addresses the following criteria uh, and each criteria is weighted as follows. So 15% uh, for the state of the problem description of the issue in, in your application response, 40% for the project design and implementation portion, 30% uh, on the capabilities and competencies section, 5% weighted for the data collection and performance measures plan, and finally 10% uh, for the budget itself. Next, I'm going to briefly highlight uh, the JMHCP application submission requirements. So really important to note uh, something that's new this year, JMHCP applications uh, must be submitted to the, the Department of Justice in a two-step process. Step one is that applicants must submit a, an SF-424 and an SFLL form uh, in grants.gov by 1159 Eastern time on June 22nd, 2021 at the link that we've referenced on the slide. And just another uh, helpful tip is to note is to 
that when you register in grants.gov, applicants will need to obtain a data universal numbering system or DUNS number. Uh, and they also need to um, go have a system for award management. The SAM system need to needs to have a registration or renewal completed. So that's step one in the process for application. Step two is that applicants must submit the full application, including any attachments by 1159 p.m. Eastern time on July 6, 2021, again at the link referenced on this slide. All applicants are encouraged, really encouraged to review the how to apply section in the OJP grant application resource guide. And also really important to note, um, OJP is really urging applicants to submit application packages at least 72 hours prior to the actual application due date to allow for the application to receive either a validation mes message or a rejection notification from grants.gov. This will allow applicants to correct anything that's needed in a timely fashion, like for example, any problems that may have led to the rejection notification. So again, uh, really important, really urging you to try to apply at least 72 hours prior to the application due date. The next three slides highlight tips to help prevent any problematic issues with your application submission. So the first, which we just covered, is to really remember that there's this new two-step process this year Make sure you're clear on the deadline for, for each process and reference the how to apply section of the OJP grant application resource guide. So remember the two step process. The second step, uh, excuse me, the second tip is to remember to make sure that you've entered the correct DUNS number uh, in the SF 424 form and that it is registered in the system for award management or SAM. The specific agency registered under this DUNS number in SAM will be responsible for submitting the full application in just grants, which is the second part of the process, and administering the award if it's funded. The next tip is to really remember that as applicants that the federal request amount entered in the SF-424 um, form should match the total federal request in your application budget for the entire grant project period. So those have to match each other. Another tip is uh, to really to look closely at page eight in the solicitation and remember not to include any of the prohibited costs that are listed on page eight. Okay, some more tips for the application submission process. Um, remember that there is a new requirement this year to actually attach the MOU between the criminal justice agency and the mental health agency partnering on the ward. So that's very important to include that uh, MOU as an attachment. Six, six tip, all applicants must complete the disclosure of duplication and cost items in just grants. And last but not least, if an applicant <coughs> is requesting to use in their, in their application to use funding to pay an outside evaluator or researcher, then applicants must complete the research and evaluation independence and integrity attachment. Again, you know, please see the OJP grant application resource guide for more specific instructions on this research and evaluation independence and integrity form. Okay, so I've been seeing that we have many questions coming in through the chat box, so we're gonna begin uh, the question and answer portion of the webinar now, and we'll respond to as many questions as possible in the time remaining. And just as a reminder, you can write in your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom right-hand corner of your screens. Uh, also, before we finish up today, we are going to show a few more slides, so please hang in there for more information about uh, the 2021 Connect and Protect solicitation, this additional J piece of the JMHGP funding. So we're going to touch on that a little bit more. We're also gonna provide you with our speaker contact information and some information on how to sign up for the CSG Justice Center newsletter. But first we will start with our Q&A. Um, so let's see, first question uh, I will ask is where do we, is being asked is where to find the actual grant application itself. So I'm not sure Demetrius, if you wanna take that or one of our BJA colleagues. <laughs> I can um I can provide the the web address um for folks. Just let me give me one second. Okay. 
maybe we can uh, chat it out. Yes. Yeah, Great. I'll do that. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I see that some of the questions have Eric, thank you. You've been answering them. So if I ask something that's already been answered, please just let me know. I just want to make sure we don't miss anything. So the first, but also maybe I'll ask them because maybe others would want to know as well. So the first question, does mental health agency quote have to be a current contractor with a state or local government, or can it be a 501 C3 that will work with the justice agency for this grant? So I think I'd probably have to direct that to Tammy or Eric. Hi, this is Eric. Yeah, I, I just responded in the chat mm -hmm. to that. The nonprofits are not eligible as a direct applicant. Okay, thank you. Um, and another potential eligibility uh, application question. Uh, our community law enforcement agency has a current collaboration with the School of Social Work at our local university. Would that qualify for the mental health agency requirement since we work with professors who are licensed mental health professionals? And I guess I'll direct that to Eric as well. <laughs> yeah, in that case, I I would just point to the language of this in the solicitation, which says that 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 agency has to be responsible for providing mental health treatment um, for the for the community, mental health and substance abuse services. Yeah, I exactly. If those prof law if those professionals are not providing direct mental health services, then they would not be eligible. Okay. Okay, there's, there's there's nothing to prevent a, u a university from serving as that mental health agency if they are going to be delivering those services as defined in the mental health agency in the solicitation. Great. Right. Okay, thank you so much, Eric and Demetrius. And I guess this is slight variation on again on the university questions that have been coming in. So um, would an applied another question is would an applied psychology research laboratory be considered a mental health agency and they say this laboratory would be uh, one where clinicians administer an intervention and are supervised by a licensed psychologist like would that be considered a mental health agency for the purposes of this application do you what uh, if i can answer that and go ahead say the last part again that they sure. will be doing they will but, be doing what so so would an applied psychology research laboratory be considered a mental health agency? And, and this laboratory would be, the situation for this laboratory as described would be one where the clinicians in the laboratory administer an intervention and are supervised by a licensed psychologist. So would that be considered a mental health agency? If they are, if they are contracted, um, yes, that they would be considered a mental health agency. Yes, they would be. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, and this is um, a separate question again, Eric. I'm not sure whether you fully answered this already or not, but uh, so one of the questions um, after listening, I think, to the services mentioned for objective one. So uh, one one question comes in an applica given application, even if some of the services mentioned for objective one are not drop off or crisis responding. Are they still allowed for consideration? So, for example, a uh, service like competency restoration. Is that an allowable activity for this particular event? Yeah, I, this is Eric. I think I can answer that. I'm hoping that CSG can make a note of that question. And then when Maria Pryor mm. gets back in the office, that that would be one that she can address, if that's okay. Sure. Sure, we can forward that. So, yes. Um, and and I guess a related question is, and I don't know if again, Dimitri, if Demetrius or Eric and Tammy, if you want to answer this or or all answer. But since this um, this particular piece of the JMHCP solicitation uh, is not focused on law law enforcement response. Can you give some examples of 
other law enforcement specific activities that might potentially be able to be funded that people can apply to fund aside from law enforcement response threat response Allison, was there a pre I'm sorry, but what, did you ask the previous question that I, I'm, I'm sorry, I was doing the responding to the other question, but I think before that question, you asked a previous question that Eric asked us to take. Oh, Noah. yes, yes, yeah, I, I have that down. Um, the question was, do you want me to repeat the question? Or, yes, I mean, please. I just, okay, so the question that Eric asked us to bring to Maria is, even though some of the services mentioned for objective one are not drop off or crisis responding, are they still allowable for consideration? So, for example, something like a service such as competency re restoration, is that an allowable activity under this? This so objective one was referring specifically to the services that may or may not be included in a crisis, specifically in a crisis service unit, right? So if the if your if your services or what you're responding to doesn't fall under that objective one then if it falls under objective two or objective three then your services will be allowable under this solicitation the competency was referring specifically to the services that may or may not be included under the services that you provide in the crisis stabilization unit okay Great. Right. Okay. Thank you, Demetrius. And um, so, just my then my somewhat related question was: since direct law enforcement response services are not focused on in this grant, can you describe some of the other services that are allowable that might be conducted by uh, by or with law enforcement? Like, what are some other allowable activities? Um, I, I can definitely answer that if an a, if law enforcement wanted to apply directly mm -hmm. to the grant as lead, is that the question? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I would say I would think about it as if folks are familiar with the intercept model, if they're not familiar with the intercept model. But as long as the criminal justice agency is focusing on things or individuals, the best way to think about it as not already in the criminal justice system, right? Or already in the criminal justice system and going out in the community, right? So if there was a law enforcement agency that wanted to work around probo um, parole, probation, and or re-entry, that would be fine, right? So I think the best way to think about it as a, a, a group of services that are focused on people who are responding immediately and not in the criminal justice system currently, that those that group of folks or responses for programs are better suited for connect and protect. If you're thinking about it in the second lump of individuals who are your responses will be responding for individuals who are already in the criminal justice system and or exiting the criminal justice system and going in the community, then law enforcement can apply under this justice and mental health collaboration program. So I think thinking it into those larger buckets, not in, not yet involved responses for individuals, connect and protect already in the community, already in the criminal justice system, or leaving the criminal justice system can respond to this justice and mental health collaboration solicitation. I think it's helpful to think about it in those two larger overall buckets. Great, thank you so much, Demetrius. Um, okay, uh, we have a question of uh, asking sort of to clarify what we called objectives versus activities. Uh, the person that's writing in is saying that they, you know, they saw the objectives one through th one through three listed uh, in in our slides, but then it seemed like the objectives were then called referred to or called activities in the deliverable section. So maybe just some clarification on the the difference between the objectives and the activities? I would say for that point, objectives and activities can be interchangeable. All right. <laughs> All right, well, that makes it easy then. <laughs> okay. Um, we have a question about the planning stage, actually, uh, which is a great question. Uh, they ask, do we need to take an entire year for the planning stage? No, you do not need to take an entire year for the 
planning stage. If you complete all the requirements that are um, in the special conditions that are assigned by BJA, one of them being completing your PNI guide, then you will be eligible to move forward with your implementation phase. So no, you do not need to complete. You do not have to take a full year to complete your um, planning phase. Excellent. All right. Well, I'll, the questions keep rolling in, so <laughs> I'll keep going. Um, so uh, one one uh, attendee today at, says that uh, asks if I work for a state department of corrections, and we have an internal mental health department, how would the MOU work? This is the MOU attachment uh, requirement. The application. I'm sorry, could you sorry, repeat I was that on question mute. again? Oh. Sure, sure. Uh, so one attendee is asking uh, in this scenario that if I work for a state department of corrections and we have an internal mental health department, how would the MOU work as far as the application? So I so the, 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 the criminal justice agency and has their own mental health department, so there it's both within their same agency. How how do they work the MOU? requirement uh, in that case. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I've never encountered that. Um, I, I think as long as they do have that internal unit that actually meets that definition, they would have to have some sort of MOU between the two um, departments. Mm -hmm. But I'd have to I'd have to give that some more thought because I have never seen that. Yeah, and I would I would think if, as long as when you're describing um, in your application that your DOC also include and it is in fact one entity operated and controlled by the same authorization um, that and you have a DOC and you have a mental health agency, I think you you would you then wouldn't need an MOU. An MOU is primarily used for to build some type of contractual agreement between entities that are not of the same thing, right? So if your entity clearly states, and it is again, authorized and controlled by the same entity as the DOC, as the, the mental health part of your agency, then you will be fine. You, you would just need to make that really clear in, in your application submission. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric and Demetrius. Um, Another question is a couple of questions about a mental health courts. So that's uh, great to see if a court's proposal seeks to enhance and expand its mental health court. Would the court be the criminal justice partner and then be required to have an MOU with a mental health agency as a partner with the project. So, I can repeat that if a court's proposal seeks to enhance and expand its mental health court. Would the court be the criminal justice partner and then be required to have an MOU with the mental health agency as a partner with, with the project? Yeah, this is Eric, that's correct. The court would be considered the criminal justice agency and then that we would expect to see a uh, service provider, mental health co-occurring substance abuse uh, provider. Great, okay. Thank you. Um, and another mental health court related question. Um, so, one attendee today says we are a state mental health division and we would like to work with the mental health court. Um, would we need to work with the police department or another criminal justice group for the purpose of this grant? I guess the question is, is the court considered the criminal justice partner or do they need to have another criminal justice group? For this JMHCP application, I think Eric, Eric, do you want to? Because you, your your previous answer kind of sort of answered this question as well. Do you want to take that? Yeah. One? Yeah, I mean, the way that I'm reading um, the definition of criminal justice agency is the the court would meet that, and they would not need to to um, partner with another agency, but I. I do think when it comes in terms of your of your project, um, you know, obviously the the monitoring um, piece of it is is important when you're when you have a court problem solving court. So I would I would just point that out. Okay, thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, uh, so uh, another question is, are there any restrictions or guidelines on submitting an application for this grant for a project they have that we have, they have already submitted an application for this year? Um, do we need a disclosure requirement? Yeah, there's a, um, there's a required um, for all, for all applicants related to disclosing any pending applications for the same costs. And that's a, that's a, an application form that's built into just grants. Previous years, it was a separate attachment, but this year it's a, will be required to fill out in just grants before your application is submitted. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Uh, another, uh, sort of. Eligibility question, um, just to clear things up, will a 401 C3, a mental health agency be considered as an applicant as long as they apply jointly with a criminal justice agency? I believe the answer to that is no, but I just want to, it seems like there's still some. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. that's right. So okay. that 501 C3 would need to a be contracted with a criminal justice agency and they could not act as lead on that. They will, it, the criminal justice agency will have to act as lead on the application. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Demetrius. Okay, another question is um, what is required for the planning phase of this grant and how should that be scaled uh, if an existing partnership or, or program is in place? That's a great question, actually. <laughs> Allison, do you want to answer that question? Because I don't. Um, so even if you, I know that even if you have, I don't know the the specifics of all of the planning phase requirements. Allison, you may know that, but as it relates to um, whether it's existing or partnership program is in in place, um, the planning phase that you that you ascribe in your application, right? Whatever those planning phases are etched out as you describe them in addition to any other special considerations that that we have or that BJA has, like the PNI guide, as long as those things are complete, then your your planning phase will be complete. Yeah, I think like we have a lot of grantees. Uh, some of them are literally starting from scratch um, as far as trying to develop their, or well, not completely some, from scratch because once they're awarded, then of course they've already developed this collaboration. But let's say now, you know, at the application phase, we have grant, we have applicants that are maybe just starting to build those collaborations, others that have long existing collaborations. Um, you know, as long as the collaboration has started, right, then the, then that's the requirement for the application. But um, for the actual planning phase on the ground, that can change things a bit, uh, depending on what sort of phase of collaboration you're in. That's one of the key components of this of this grant is to have that cross system collaboration and communication. So, you know, in the planning phase, that's definitely one of the key pieces that either has to be further developed or just sussed out completely because that will give you the best, one of the best tools that you have to move forward in your implementation process, right? Is these two agencies working together. So that that's just a, a basic key component of the grant work, no matter which intercept you're working in, I would say, if that makes sense. Can't underestimate that importance of that. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, if we have, um, I want to make sure we didn't miss any questions in the in the chat while uh, there's some, I think there are some other questions here. Um, Chris, if you could maybe um, try to pull them out for me, but I can see one here. Can you speak to the type of data collection requirements? I could I couldn't be able to speak to the data 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 collection requirements. I don't know if Eric or Tammy would be able to. Um, it kind of depends on the project, but there is 
there is information that's linked to in the solicitation on data collection and your considerations you should give. Okay, great. Um, another question is, um, is it a requirement to have a research, a researcher and or an evaluator? If, if they have a system analysis, uh, anal excuse me, a system analyst in house, can we use them? So, I guess the question is, number 1, is it a requirement to have a researcher or, or evaluator? And can that researcher or evaluator be internal if that's uh, if that's allowable? It is not required to have a researcher or evaluator. Okay. And if a if a program wants to use their internal analyst analysis capacity, is that allowable? As opposed to hiring someone that's external. Oh, yeah. so okay. That would be fine. Yes, we don't we don't require an outside evaluator. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question around whether a not for profit. Uh, if a non a nonprofit is con contracted with a mental health board, does that does eligibility change there? I, I, I would say the broader answer is no. Okay. Um, a lot of a lot of mental health boards are intended to act independent of the mental health agency itself. So the broader answer is no. The board is not the actual agency or the entity. So that that organization will need to be specifically contracted with or have an MOU with the actual agency and not just this board. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, Mike, the uh, attendee writes, my county has restarted the stepping up initiative and is meeting to implement a jail diversion program. Collaborators include our sheriff's office, judicial circuit of our state court system, particularly mental health court, NAMI, and our mental health managing entity through our state department of children and families. Who would you suggest should be the lead applicants? Hmm. Well, Nanny... yeah, this is this is Eric. Um, oh, yeah, Eric. I, I, I responded to this, but I mean, ultimately, whoever the lead applicant is going to be the agency that is willing to administer the grant and, and manage the finances, submit progress reports, manage all the partnerships. Um, and that and that may answer your question because certain agencies may be willing to do that and certain agencies may not. Um, and then, of course, they would have to be an eligible applicant according to the to the solicitation. Um, and then, of course, you would have to have that partnership between a mental health agency and a law enforcement agency. But in terms of, you know, as long as they're an eligible applicant, they have to be willing to be the one um, doing the physical responsibility, administrative responsibility of the grant. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. If I can just piggyback on what Eric just said, the, the lead grant is expected to kind of sort of oversee the grantee and all of its sub-recipients or sub-grantees. So the, I would say that the great lead grantee should be the entity out in addition to all of the other eligibility requirements, but also that entity who has the capacity to really lead the grant Lead this any and all sub grantees or sub recipients. Great, thank you. Okay, one second. Okay, our next question. Um, if a local government is a lead applicant, are we allowed to subcontract the local mental health authority for implementation and partner with the local jail operated by state government to fulfill re the grant requ application requirements? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just, Chris and I think to me. I think we yeah. have one more question, Allison. I don't know if this was answered by you. Um, you asked this or if it was answered by Eric in the chat, but could you extrapolate on what you mean by this grant must be jointly administered? Did we did we answer that question? No, we did not. 
Okay. So what we mean is jointly administ administrated means you have both a criminal justice component and some mental health component that are working in achieving the, the, the objectives activities of the program together. That is what we mean by jointly administrated. It doesn't have, it cannot be jointly applied, but it has to be jointly administrated in that the mental health agency and the criminal justice agency are working on achieving and delivering the program together. Great, thank you so much, Demetrius. Another question is, um, we know that, you know, evaluators or researchers are not required, but um, an attendee is asking, um, are outside evaluators preferred in any way? I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. Um, I, I don't think that that would be a preference. Obviously, there are benefits to having outside evaluators in terms of integrity, but um, I would say that it it probably wouldn't 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 make a make a difference when it comes to um, evaluating the project, as long as you're doing a good job describing what the evaluator is going to be doing. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, this is great. We're getting a lot of questions, um, <laughs> so uh, we're glad happy for the uh, audience interest. So. Uh, another question uh, is from someone who had to join a little bit uh, late due to WebEx issues, and they're asking just to repeat, what is the number of awards, the amount for each, and the duration of the project? So the anticipated number of awards is 18 with the, um, the anticipated maximum dollar amount for each awardee being $550,000. What was, oh, and the duration of the project is a total of 36 months or three years. And the three years, yeah, because there's a related question actually. So the three years is the total of the grant um, award period, including both planning and implementation, correct? Correct. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so the people in the, someone in the audience is also asking, can they get a copy of all the questions and answers covered in this presentation? Um, I know we're taking that in the Q and A um, section. Chris, is that, or I'm not sure, Demetrius, maybe you know, can we share, is there a way tech wise to share the Q and A with everyone or is that not necessarily possible or should they just listen? to the recording <laughs> of the webinar, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, I'm maybe not certain if it. we can give, yeah, I'm not certain if we can give the copy, but I would say you can definitely listen to it because we will be circulating the audio. Okay. Great, okay. Um, I'm just searching to see if there are some other questions. Um, one question says, um, there's an also there is also an RFP out now for continuation grants for current BJA programs. This is by invitation only. Our, this is what the question how the question reads: Are programs currently funded by a JMHCP grant like this one eligible to receive an invitation to apply from the, from this continuation RFP? Oh, I'm not familiar with yeah, that the, at all, but the, <laughs> yeah, I'm not familiar with that either. <laughs> It, the solicited the solicited um, solicitation that's open right now for BGA is, is not intended for justice mental health current justice mental health grantees. That's intended for others that will be receiving an invitation. Okay, so that's completely separate then. Okay. Um, I think okay. we had another question. Again, excuse me if Allison you asked and and or Eric you answered this. But does the application guide define a mental health agency for purposes of this grant? It does. Um, and it is the first, it is on the first page of the solicitation, the definition for this authorization or solicitation of a mental health agency. And it's also included the definition. Go ahead, Eric. 
No, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Go ahead. No, I, I've seen a lot more questions in the chat, and I, I, I know there's a lot of confusion, and I'm into it, on whether a 501c3 is eligible to apply yeah. directly as the lead applicant. I, I think the confusion there is that they are not listed among the regular eligible applicants, but they list other, and then under other, they list a mental health agency, and that's where they list the mental health agency, and they also explain it could be a contracted organization. Um, so the the issue with there obviously would be no issue with like a community, you know, health board or uh, an authority. And I know different states do it in different ways, but essentially, you know, the single agency that is that is designated by that locality to provide mental health services. Those agencies could be 501c3. So obviously, there would be no issue with that agency um, as the designated mental health agency for that locality to apply. The issue that I would see and where I would say you would not be eligible um, or where you would not be successful is if you're talking about a 501c3 that just happens to have a contract to be a contracted provider with another agency just to provide some services perhaps in the jail. The issue there is that contracts end um, and then if that contract ended with the locality, um, the grant would have to be terminated and then the mental health 501c3 wouldn't be able to fulfill that law enforcement partnership and they'd be you know, potentially on the hook to return all those grant funds. So I would say it's not exclusively prohibited, but I would say in that situation, um, you, it, you know, and it, it, it's perfectly fine for the, a law enforcement agency or the county or the city to have you know, a 501c3 partner that they are contracting with and, and, and for purposes of grants that probably be considered a subaward once if, if it was awarded would I would say that in that case we would expect the city um, or the law enforcement agency to be the direct applicant and not a contracted 501c3 that could potentially you know lose that contract and and, and threaten the and threaten the grant project hopefully that clears the things up great thank you um we have a question that's really pretty budget related, so I'm sure either you know Tracy or Eric can probably take this one. Um, what are examples of in kind match? Yeah, in in kind match is any match, any kind of source that sources match contributed to the project that is not from the applicant, or from the grantee. So. So the applicant is awarded the app, any any funds that the applicant that the, the recipient award recipient is is putting toward the project. For example, their own salaries, their own fringe, um, that would all be considered cash match because it's coming from their own account, and the the grant awards will be in their own accounting system. So that would be considered cash match coming from their own budget. In kind match, which we also call third party match, would be would be match contributed by partners, volunteers included. So the the, the the value of time committed by a partner agency would be considered in kind third party matched um, volunteers and you know any cost from a partner would be considered in kind match. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Great. Um, can you please uh, define? Excuse me. Um, does the Department of Justice have any resources that provide examples of how to document one of the DOJ priority areas related to promotion of civil rights, access to justice, et cetera? I'm, I'm not sure I, under, I fully understand that question. And maybe just, that's just me. I think it's, it's the priority me. areas. I think it's really, you know, it's asking about the how to, maybe in the application process, how to document some of the priority areas like rural areas or, you know, how to. Got it. Yeah, that's what I think. But if, if that's not the case, um, maybe the attendee can clarify in the in the Q and A. But so they're asking, are there any resources? Do DOJ have any resources on, um, you know, with examples of how to do that portion of the application. Address, yeah, address that part of the yeah. application. That makes sense. Is that maybe that's in the gui application guide or somewhere else or? Uh, 
I'm not familiar with any example of how to meet priority areas. Um, maybe that was one to pass on to Maria, if, if see if she's familiar with it, but I'm not familiar with examples okay. related to that. Okay. Yeah, so I, I can definitely, we can definitely elevate that to Maria. And I will say in the interim, and we can definitely follow up with any outstanding um, FAQ questions. I will say in the interim, you should definitely check out the OJP grant application resource guide. They may provide some direction in how to how to respond to and answer priority era questions. Okay. Uh, another eligibility question, just to clarify, and forgive me if you've already clarified this, but I just want to make sure everyone you know that is asking in different ways gets their gets their clarification. Um, an attendee is asking, please clarify whether an FQHC, that is a mental health, substance use disorder, and housing provider, would not be eligible. I think I'm imagining they mean to be a lead agency on this grant. Yeah, all I can do is is reference the response I gave a little while ago. Yeah. Um, you know, I I I can't you know I I can't answer such a specific instance without knowing a little bit more. But I you know I think I'll just let my my answer cover mm -hmm. cover it okay. before that. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, for uh, a question about objective three, is mental health training an allowable expense for Department of Corrections staff under this this grant so that they can better serve at least individuals with mental health needs? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, an attendee is asking whether they'll be able to print a copy of this PowerPoint used for the WebEx. Yes, they will. You'll get a PDF version off of our website, and you should be able to download it and and print a copy uh, of the PDF if you're interested. Um, people are also asking how to contact Demetrius. <laughs> so I'll just uh, let everyone know that before we finish today, we're gonna be, we have a slide with all of the speakers' contact information. We'll be showing that, uh, and it will it's one of our slides coming up um, before we end the webinar. Um, so another question is a, as a clarifying point. Um, does the JMHCP fund services to divert people who were arrested but have not been convicted pre-trial? Um, or does JMHCP only fund re-entry or services for people who have been convicted? So no, so yes, services that are for folks who have been arrested or accused of any crime are eligible under, under this solicitation. Um, the, this, don't, don't confuse that with the distinction of what programs are available, right? So the, the the programs that are or services that are available under this program, that's the, the conversation around reentry. Um, but those who are eligible in terms of participants of any program, anyone that is has been accused of a crime, arrested, or awaiting trial will qualify for the program notwithstanding any other, you know, any other requirements, but generally speaking, if a person has been accused of a crime or wherever they are and the, um, in their, in their case is eligible for, for, for these services. Great. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Um, we have a question on clarifying what defines a contracted mental health agency. Does this mean that the agency must be paid by the criminal justice agency or is an MOU, MOA between the agencies acceptable to, as a definition of being contracted? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in that case, contracted means, means paid, but it doesn't have to be a contracted agency. It, it also could be a state or local government um, agency that is responsible for health services in that in that um, in that area. So I mentioned before the, the example of a 501c3 that's been given authority to to act as the mental health provider for that state or locality. Not technically a contract, although they're get, they're probably getting funded directly from the state and the local together. But that 
that that agency would would be able to apply as as the mental health. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, so we have sort of some timeline related questions. I'll try to maybe group them together. Um, so uh, one attendee is asking, what is the timeline for making the awards and for initiating work on the project? Uh, we try to make award fiscal year, which will be September 30th, and then the, the award perform period of performance for this uh, for the grants will be October 1. 2021. Um, Dust grants is a new system, so um, you know there's there's also always potential that there's going to be delays, but our our goal is always to make them by September 30th. Okay, great. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, uh, somewhat related question about time and planning ahead. Um, how can applicants plan for how much time it will take to complete all the activities in the planning and, and implementation guide? Um, since, you know, since this involves working with the Justice Center, is there a way for applicants to know about how much time monthly would be spent on <coughs> working on the guide, the P&I guide? Allison, did you want to answer that question? Um, it's uh, I can try. Please add in anything else uh, that you that you think as well. I think it's um, let's see. It's the um, up to eight months. Am I remembering correctly? This year for uh, after budget approval, that uh, is gen is is the goal for completion, working on and completing the planning. Phase, which includes as a major activity, the uh, working with your TA coach on the planning and implementation guide. <coughs> we know just from you know experience that some some grantee teams finish that sooner. Um, some take maybe a little longer than eight months, but you know in general we're aiming for that eight month uh, time frame. And the reason for that is you you know there's I, I'm sure people can identify this. So many uh, people uh, working on the ground you're you know, it's often the case where you're, um, you know, building building uh, the plane as you're flying it, right? And we, it's it's almost like a luxury to have some time to really take out for planning, uh, proper planning. That is one of the great processes that will help maybe not eliminate every bump in the road, but eliminate a lot of bumps in the road before you shift into implementation. So your TA coach will work with the team to try to support them at the pace that is going to work best for the project. You know, again, reasonably close to that eight month. Uh, Mark, uh, as to how much time it takes monthly to work on the on the planning and implementation guide, that's really tough to answer. Um, you know, just projects are different, have different complicating factors or you know, maybe levels of experience working on grant projects, even, you know, sometimes if it's a first grant that a team is is um, working on, it just might take a little bit longer to get used to the grant administration processes. But so it's really hard to predict that. Uh, I, I can't really hazard how much time monthly, <laughs> but, you know, again, your TA coach will work with with each grantee team individually to try to support um, completion of all the planning activities. So we're here to work at a pace that's going to work best for the grant project also. Honor Demetrius, if you have anything else. I cannot answer that. You answered that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so another sort of planning versus implementation question is I understand uh, one applicant, uh, excuse me, one attendee says that they understand that up to $100,000 of the grant funds uh, could be allocated for the plan can be allocated for towards the planning stage that would leave a maximum balance of 450,000 remaining. What if you don't need the full 100,000 because the planning is well on its way? Are you able to apply a greater balance to the implementation phase? I.e. in excess of 450,000 if you get the max award. Yes, you can. Uh, solicitation says you can revise your budget after completion of the planning um, phase to, based on, of course, the results of the planning may influence your implementation project. Um, but also, if it's completed with less than 100,000, um, you certainly can request a budget modification to use the remainder toward uh, implementation. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, 
So this is a pretty specific question about the application process. Is it possible to create an application in just grants before we submit the SF424 via grants.gov? No, it's not possible. You need to complete the grants.gov portion first before you can complete the start the just grants part process. Okay. Uh, another question, would an assessment center, uh, and they specify non-construction costs around an assessment uh, center, where law enforcement could bring individuals experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis and having and have committed a crime instead of taking them to jail, would that uh, be eligible under this grant? So an assessment center, non-construction related costs, um, sort of sounds like a drop off or a crisis or deflection center where law enforcement could bring individuals experiencing mental behavioral health crisis and have committed a crime and be eligible under this grant. Yes, as long as that assessment center is tied um, with an eligible applicant, right? So as long as they are either contracted or part of a mental health agency. Um, contracted with the state or local government, the services that are provided under a crisis stabilization center are definitely eligible under this, right? The issue is in this question is are the, who would be the applicant for this and making sure that the applicant is eligible to be lead on this. But the program in and of itself is absolutely eligible for this solicitation. Great, thank you so much, Demetrius. Um, okay, uh, this is, uh, I, I think hopefully, I think we've answered this question, but can you, uh, an, an attendee is asking, can you repeat what you said about a county government running a mental health court and collaborating with the local jail? Does that meet both the mental health and criminal justice collaboration requirements? I believe the earlier question also had a mental health agency involved. So, but. Yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. So under this question, the missing component um, would be the mental health agency piece. So that would be an, a, a mental health agency that is providing mental health services and, um, and or mental health services um, co-occurring mental health, mental illness, um, service, uh, service abuse, um, substance abuse. So the missing component in this is that mental, mental health component, the criminal justice and the county government, um, are fine. The, it's just the criminal justice agency component. I mean, the mental health justice agency component that's missing here. Great. Thank you. Um, so, um. There's a question about who makes the final decision on applications, CSG or BJA. I I can definitive <laughs> I can state that BJA makes that final decision. Uh, they are the funder, not not the CSG Justice Center. If anyone has anything else to add to that, please uh, let me know. <laughs> um, and I will also ask: uh, Is there a comp is a competitive bid process required when contracting with a mental health provider? That's a great question. I'm sorry, I blanked out. Can you say that question again? Sure. Is a competitive. Oh, Eric, Eric, Eric oh. is responding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, federal grants do require open, open, and free competition. Um, depend obviously depending on the services and the amount. Um, I would refer you to the information in the in the financial guide and also to CFR 200. But I think what what Tammy covered in one of her slides is what we find is is some people um, are misclassifying what that we are calling a contract, which you can certainly use a, a contract with a mental health agency. But depending on the level of of detail and and work that that mental health agency is is performing related to the Justice Mental Health Project, we would actually consider them a sub sub grantee in particular for the justice mental health program where it's considered a partnership um you know law enforcement agency would not be eligible on its own it needs that partnership so in, in essence that mental health agency is is 
even though they're not the app, not the recipient, they are they're performing a critical role that that is necessary to meet the goals and objectives of the federal federal award. In, in which case, they would be considered a sub grantee. Um, and but sub the difference distinction between between sub sub awards and procurement contracts is that a sub award is is does not need to be competitively bid. It's, it's essentially a project partner. Um, there are other response. There are other requirements for the recipient to manage that sub recipient, but competitive bidding is not one of them. If that is a truly a sub recipient relationship, um, but on the other hand, if the mental health agency is is not considered a sub recipient and is just providing services irrespective of the project, um, then then there is obviously if if you if your agency deems it a procurement contract and not a sub grant, then and 2 CFR 200 does require full and open competition. Great, thanks so much, Eric. Uh, we have just a few minutes left um, for questions and then I'll leave a few minutes at the end just to cover the additional slides I wanted to. So, um, so there's a question about how do you, uh, excuse me, there's a, a question about is this funding opportunity specific to the adult population or does it also include juvenile justice? So working with juveniles. I believe the answer to that is yes, you can also submit for juvenile projects. Is that correct? I don't think so. I think I we can follow up, but I think this is for adult only. Juvenile is administered through the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Program, but we can definitely follow up um, in the FAQ. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I, we have, we have like youth like focused in JMHCP. Like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I would like Maria to be able to answer that. So, okay. No, I'm sorry, so that I don't, I don't get the wrong answer. Last, okay. last year, there was a separate, a separate solicitation for juveniles offered mm -hmm. by OJJDP. I don't know if that's still the case this year or not for this particular program. So I, I think we should ask Maria for that guidance. Great, okay. Um, and uh, there's a question about um, basically applicants who have currently active JMHCP grants. So um, they're asking whether, um, one second, sorry, is expansion and enhancement of an existing program um, allowed? So are you allowed, you know, if you have a currently active, are you allowed to apply to expand? A project that is already currently actively funded from JMHCP. Yes, you you can. I would just would have to be careful and and detailed in explaining how you're going to avoid any kind of duplication of costs mm -hmm. and really try to separate the 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 project scope versus what was awarded before. And yeah, so, and and, yeah. and just being very intentional doing your planning part, right? Like yes. you have to have a planning and an implementation phase. And if it sounds like, for lack of a better word, this this idea of like sustainable, like are you are you sustaining? No, you cannot use it to sustain your previous program. But if you're saying that your program is at a certain place and you want to use this funding to expand it or do something in advance of this that is completely fine but during your planning phase you have to and then your planning submission documents and outlining you have to be very clear on what do you how what do you plan to do to build it out and then be able to do it and explain that in your implementation phase great thank you um okay uh one Last clarification and one last question, and then um, unless I've missed something, Demetrius and uh, Chris, a question, let me know. But um, so there's a question on uh, about the just grants application. So it said the uh, questioner says, since we cannot access the just grants application in advance of submitting the SF 424, is it possible to access a template for the objectives, timelines, etc.? I don't know if that form 
so that you can see it on, on our website. I would check the Office of Justice Programs website and their resources and application forms. I don't know if it's there or not. Um, but I, you know, I do know that, you know, you, you, you can obviously go ahead and with your, your goals and objectives based on your project and, and, you know, following, you know, the smart, smart model, have them, have them all laid out. And I, you know, my understanding, it's just a matter of, of inputting them in, for, in, in blanks when you get to that stage. But like I said, you can try to find that blank form. I don't know if it's available on, on the website or not. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to sneak in one last question. <laughs> um, so the last question is, how do you differentiate federal funds versus match in just grants web form for the budget? Definitely a question for, I think I uh, excuse me, <laughs> Eric and, and, or, um, yeah, BJ and or Tammy. <laughs> yeah, there's the, the federal forms. Federal funds, any federal cost will will be tallied in the federal request column, and any any match will be tallied in the non-federal request column, and and it should be pretty pretty simple to see which which columns you input them in in the in the forms. Very similar to to our to our Excel budget spreadsheet that we used to re require as an attachment. It'll it'll be clearly designated. Great, thank you so much, Eric. Um, and I just want to clarify to the audience, there was a question about uh, where they can find the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint. It will be on the CSG Justice Center website, um, which, and I believe it's on the, going to be on the events page. Is that uh, correct, Demetrius? Yes, it will be on our yeah. events page. That is yes. correct. Should be by next week at the latest. It will be posted. Um, we're also going to have a slide before we finish today that has our contact information. And if you have any questions about find, locating that, just reach out to one either Demetrius or myself, and we can direct put, point you in the right you know direction get, and let you know the status of that. Yeah, and also realizing um, that the actual application deadline date is yes. the 20th. We're definitely going to work to try to get this posted okay. on those web pages as soon as possible. Sooner than that. Okay, great. Okay, um, I think in the interest we just have, of time, we just have a couple more minutes, and I think we got through most, if not all, questions. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to us if you have further questions, but heading back to the PowerPoint slides, um, if we could just uh, take a look at uh, slide, I believe it's 37, the next slide. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Chris. So just, uh, we also just wanted to highlight before we finish today, uh, not this other uh, BJA funding opportunity uh, for JMHCP, which is the 2021 Connect and Protect Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Responses Solicitation. So the Connect and Protect Law Enforcement Behavioral Health Response Program is part of the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, part of JMHCP. It is designated to support law enforcement, behavioral health cross-system collaboration, and to improve public safety responses and outcomes for individuals, individuals with mental illness or co-occurring co mental illness and substance addictions, or CMESA as we call it, uh, who also come into contact with the criminal justice system. So BJA is seeking applicants for this piece of the JMHCP grant to design or enhance a law enforcement behavioral health response to people with mental illness or CMISA who come into contact with law enforcement due to their illness. Um, so just please note that, the, that this Connect and Re Protect solicitation has separate deadlines. The grant, again, it's a two-phased application process. The grants.gov deadline is July 6th, 2021, 11.59 uh, p.m. <laughs> Eastern time. And the Just Grants deadline portion is July 20th. 2021, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be hosting a separate webinar for the solicitation. Um, the date is to be determined, but it's going to be soon. <laughs> so just please stay on the lookout for the registration information. And we, we really just encourage you to consider also applying for this funding. And um, please feel free to share it with your networks uh, because other law enforcement agencies that you know, your partners may also be interested in attending. Okay, and then the next slide, um, we have, uh, on this slide, we've provided the contact information for the presenters today. Um, 
And so please, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any further questions. So I'll just let that sit for just a sec. And um, then our, our final slide for today before we wrap up. If you haven't done so already, uh, we really encourage you to join into the CSG Justice Center newsletter listserv. Uh, not only is it a great way to learn about funding opportunities such as the JMHCP grant, but you will also receive really great information on upcoming trainings and resources that are developed by our agency in conjunction with BJA and also you know, key partner agencies. So again, we're gonna, we recorded this webinar. It's going to be posted along with the slide deck on the CSG Justice Center website event page. I really just wanna say a special thank you to all of the speakers today for joining in and also all of you in the uh, attendees in the audience. Thank you so much for your interest in this funding opportunity. We appreciate all the questions. We had a lot of great information sharing today and uh, good luck in your applications. And I hope everyone has a good, Evening. We'll finish up now. Thank you so much. Take care.